Welcome to the GTN show. Today, we are gonna be hearing from the Iron Cowboy himself, hot off his 101 Iron Distance triathlons. We've also got a super speedy 5K by a 12 year old. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we've got the women bossing it at the Western States 100 mile race. Happily, lots of racing news this week, but also some more races getting postponed, canceled. Um, the Swiss announced the Olympic triathlon team, and we've got our usual caption competition. All right, we're gonna hit the show running super fast, excuse the pun there. We have just spotted an incredible performance by Emma McKee, a 12 year old girl who has run a 5K in 16, 27. Yeah, I mean, that Pretty is incredible. She That's three minutes 17 per K. Yeah, for exactly. A, for a 12 year old. Surprisingly, the fastest time clocked by a 12 year old in the world ever. Um, I mean, it's an exciting talent to watch and see where she could progress with that. I mean, I can only dream of those times at whatever age I've been. <laughs> so, um, yeah, impressive running over there. I think you've got another impressive more, run story. Yeah, more news from the running world. Um, Lambert Sanelli from, from France ran the whole island of Corsica basically from north to south over the mountains, uh, 180 kilometers, 13,800 meters of climbing in 30 hours. Yeah, just I just switched off when you said the distance even <laughs> then. I was like, uh, you broke the record madness. by 41 minutes. So uh, impressive, impressive running there. Yeah, that is crazy stuff. Well, our final little snippet we've got from social media this week is George Goodwin having some, I guess, good luck in the fact that he's had bad luck after his race. Yeah, he came back from winning on the weekend to pick up his bike, I think in bike racking, wasn't it? And discovered he had a completely pancake flat tire. I would definitely define that as good luck. Yeah. That could have happened five Ks from the end of the bike and he definitely wouldn't have been the European champion. Or even champion. During, the, during the swim or exactly. something. I don't, has that ever uh, happened to you? It has happened to me. I've found my bike with a flat tire. And, and you've been okay on the race? The, after the race, yeah. Oh God, you must just be <laughs> so, like, Phew. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's all, good, it all fun again. Riding home from the race to your hotel, pretty difficult. Oh, that's true, yeah. <laughs> but I think especially if you've won, you're gonna be exactly. riding high anyway, Not aren't you? Not a problem. Yeah. A few weeks ago, we talked about the incredible feat from James Lawrence, AKA the Iron Cowboy, when he completed those 101 Iron Distance triathlons in 101 days. He did catch us out with that final extra day and he's promised to have a chat to us, but we had to give him a little bit of time to recover, which I think was only fair. And Mark has now caught up with him. So delighted to welcome James Lawrence to GTN. Now we've given you a few weeks to recover from your pretty, pretty <laughs> epic battle. Uh, and I have to ask, how is the body feeling? Uh, actually, the body feels pretty good. Um, I was shocked it's the mind that's uh, having a hard time coming around. Um, I've been sleeping a lot. Um, I just had a, a procedure done on my foot. We cut a tendon on the bottom of the foot to straighten out the hammer toe. I should have done it years ago. It would have caused me a lot less trouble in the hundred, but um, took care of it now. And so hopefully we don't have problems going forward. We're talking of injuries. I mean, have you, did you experience any others? Obviously I, I saw that you were having issues with your shins and you had these carbon shin plates made. Yeah. How are they and are, were there any others? Yeah, so the shin was the first major problem. Um, we did get some carbon shin plates. We had a, a stress fracture in the shin. And so the, the carbon plate was unbelievable. It actually offloaded the shin. Um, and allowed me to keep going while that, that healed. Um, so that was pretty crazy. And then unfortunately that caused a slight imbalance. And once we got over the shin issues and that shin bone actually healed, then my hip had some problems on the other side. And then we dealt with some pretty intense hip problems. Um, obviously shins and your hips are pretty pivotal uh, when you're doing a full distance triathlon and covering 140 miles. And so it caused some problems, caused some pain, uh, but we just kept showing up. And I'm right in saying you pretty much did the same course day in, day out, right? Yeah, we, we switched it about 20 in. Um, the course that we had had a little bit too much um, elevation gain to it. So we kept tweaking, tweaking until we eliminated about 800 feet. You know, and you, you take 800 feet times the remaining 80 days, and that's a, a significant amount of climbing that we were able to remove. Do you think you'll be retracing any of those routes again? <laughs> Are you not, uh, <laughs> not in the foreseeable future. I, I live in an unbelievable place to train. And so I could see the mountains every day and we were riding more flat um, in the farm roads. Um, and so obviously I'm going to continue with my recovery. 
Um, but then I'm going to, I'm going to go gravel bike and mountain bike and head up into the mountains and, and have, uh, have some fun up there. Awesome. Um, and I mean, obviously you would have gone through a considerable amount of calories. Um, what was your daily nutrition like? Yeah, uh, I mean, we tried to eat real food. I didn't do a single goo pack or anything on the on the hundred days, um, and, and just ate a lot of wraps, a lot of sandwiches. Um, at night, I would have a full meal, and so that that ranged from steak to chicken to to sushi. Um, and and you know, we had to consume eight thousand calories a day in order to keep moving because you're not just fueling for one day. You, you got to think about the next day, the next day, the next day, and you got to think about healing properties as well. And so one of the harder things we have to do is, is get, the, get the nutrition right. And initially I was consuming way too much processed sugars and just a lot of donuts. And um, that added to the inflammation, which added to the, the joint problems. And so we, we, you know, Sunny Joe, my wife, cleaned that up pretty quick and said no more. And, uh, and then things started to get better. A anything odd in that diet, the nutrition, or anything you felt you couldn't live without? during it? Um, I did treat myself with a fruit tart every night to celebrate. Nice, nice. <laughs> um, and on that, on that vein, uh, any kits that you couldn't live without during the whole hundred and one days? I mean, I mean, the shin brace played a huge role. Mm. Um, cycling, um, we, we worked really hard on a custom saddle by Buy Saddle okay. um, that we, we've now put into to market. I didn't have any saddle sores. I used... Um, um, DZ Nuts cream and the custom saddle that's fully adjustable by Buy Saddle. Um, and for 100 days, I had no numbness and very few saddle sores. And to do, uh, you know, 112 miles a day for 100 days to not have those issues was huge. Oh, that's really cool. Um, obviously, yeah, you went through a lot there. Were there any points where you thought, I'm going to have to quit and this isn't possible? You know, when I was at the, the peak of my shin pain and the peak of my hip pain, you have those moments. I mean, I was going to, they were either going to drag me off the course or I was going to break a bone because yeah. um, that's just, you know, I made a commitment. Uh, obviously, it was being well documented um, on what we were doing. N never was I going to quit, but, you know, on anything. I mean, the, the, the campaign was a quarter of a year. And as humans, when things get hard, obviously, the, you know, the thought does go through your, your mind, but we teach at a high level, you know, process that, feel that, but then have a quick turnaround and get back to business. And so every member of the team had these moments of breakdown and like, Ugh, can we do this? Uh, but ultimately, the team rallied around that person real quick and had a, a quick turnaround. I remember one night my, I was struggling really, really bad. I was standing in the shower and my wife kind of peeked in and I was in tears. And, uh, and, and she said, you're done today. You don't have to do anything else tonight. Just let it go. And um, the team's here to work on you. Just get on the table, fall asleep, and we'll see what tomorrow brings. And I thought that was such great advice um, because I was just sitting there shrugging my shoulders in the shower like I, I can't. And it was early on. I'm talking the teens uh, when the pain was super high because um, you go through that adaptation phase to your body's freaking out. It's like, what the hell? What are we doing? And I've learned that once, you know, your body adapts. I mean, I, we told everybody I was going to get stronger as this thing went. And if you look at my last 15, no, very little pain, very few problems. We were in a routine. Uh, a full distance became habitual for, for my body to the point where we, we got up and did one more, right? And so we did, we did 101 to teach the lesson of, look, when you think you're broken, um, you, you can get up and do one more. Now, I don't know how many times you're going to have to do one more, but I promise you, you can do one more and eventually whatever you're dealing with will go away. And I don't, I don't like to teach not from experience. And so I felt, look, in order to teach this at the highest level, I've got to go do it. I'm not going to be that, that kind of uh, mentor, coach or teacher that says, hey, I read this one time. It should work. You know, go, go do that. And so I lead from the front. Um, I, uh, the best way to, to parent or to teach or to coach is to set an example. And so I felt that it was super important that if I was going to teach that concept, um, that I needed to go out and do one more. Yeah, brilliant. Well, you definitely have done that. And yeah, once again, big well done. Enjoy that R&R &R and getting into the mountains. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks ever so much for joining us today and hopefully catch up with you soon. Yeah, let me know if we, uh, I can do anything else for you guys. Thanks, man. Well, thanks for talking to us, James. Uh, I haven't done half that many triathlons and I was a professional for, for 14 years at Ironman. No time for retirement, James, come on. <laughs>
Moving on with some other triathlon news. The Swiss have announced the Olympic team for Tokyo, and no surprises, Nicholas Berg's in the team. Her fifth Olympic Games, which is very impressive. What's even more impressive, potentially, is that she's still a medal contender, very much so. Yeah, she's so really come to form over she, the last like month or so, hasn't she's she? She's definitely someone, someone to watch in, in the Games. Uh, joining her on the team, Yolanda Annen, uh, on the women's side, Andreas Salvesberg and Max Studer, who recently won the Super Sprint uh, European Champs. Uh, so they'll have a pretty solid team for the yeah. mixed relay. Well, yeah, because they qualified in the relay as well, didn't they? So exactly. exciting to see what those guys can produce. Well, we're still waiting as a uh, time of filming this to hear the announcement from the Australian team. Now, they've secured six places, so three for the men, three for the women. And they're kind of just keeping us hanging at the moment. I mean, you guys might know by the time this goes out, but they had another race on the weekend after the qualification had closed, but it could well have been part of their selection or helping the, selec the selectors to decide. Matt Hauser winning the men's Oceana Cup and it was Kelly Ann Perkins, the women. So whether we'll see those two names in the mix, who knows? But moving on with the racing that's coming up, we've seen quite a few changes in the schedule as expected throughout the year and a few more just recently. So World Triathlon have just announced that the Duathlon World Championships are now being moved from Almere in the Netherlands to Alville in Spain and actually going to be in November due to COVID restrictions in the Netherlands. There's also been quite a lot of changes happening to the WTCS series and as a result, there's a lot of races have been moved and they're now after the grand final. So I think there's only, what, three races? Now, how many are making up for this year's series, did you say, James? Yeah, they've moved them after the the grand final, yeah, which is in, in Edmonton, Edmonton yeah. at the end of August. Uh, so they're now going to count points towards the 2022 mm -hmm. world title, world championship. And there's one less race every time for the 2021 yeah. grand final title. So it's interesting to see how, how they're adjusting all of that and 2022 might see nine races scoring yeah. points for the championship. It's and madness. A lot less than 2021. But I, I think it's kind of wise. I mean, so the the recent event is Hamburg, which was supposed to be in July. It's now going to be in September. But I mean, realistically, I can't imagine many athletes were get, were going to go if they're going to the games. Would you risk the chance of getting COVID or having to, you know, no one, none of the top athletes are going to do it anyway? I think they? that's their thinking. And with the with the rise in COVID cases, these travel is getting harder and harder. So yeah, Bermuda is also going to be after after the grand final and then obviously Abu Dhabi right at the end of the year in, in November. Fingers crossed all those races actually happen, yeah. of course. And it means we get lots of exciting racing to watch into the autumn. So that's great for us. <laughs> this past weekend, we also saw the Western States 100 miler, the world's oldest 100 mile foot race. Uh, it's uh, in California and it descends 23,000 feet and only climbs 18,000 feet. So only. it's mostly downhill, right? I love the way you say that with just an only pitch. <laughs> and I think, imagine your quads after descending that amount. It was ridiculous. Well, some impressive results. The men's race was won by Jim Walmsley in a time of 14 hours, 46 minutes, which is just mind blowing. But it was the women's performances that I found the most impressive. It was Beth Pascal who won the women's race in a time of 17 hours, 10 minutes, 41 seconds. And she was actually seventh overall. And then the stats go beyond that for the women. So we actually three women in the top 10. And within the top 21, it's a bit of a random stat, but it was 50% of the, so 10 women, sorry, were in the top 21 which just goes to show as the distance gets longer, how women really come into their own. Definitely, they need to watch their backs. Yeah, impressive stuff. Speaking of distances, it's the Tour de France again. Everyone's watching the Tour de France and we're trying to get on with our work without watching it <laughs> and failing some days. But uh, someone taking it to the next level, the Tour de France, Lachlan Morton, riding for Education First, EF Education First, is riding the whole tour on his own. Bit lonely. But he's doing it the way they did it in 1903. Where the end of each stage, he rides to the start of the next stage. So he's gonna, gonna go a total of 5,500 kilometers over 23 days. He's not gonna have rest days. He's gonna obviously have to be riding to yeah. catch up and, and get a bit of a buffer because he's trying to stay ahead of the actual tour. He's gonna be riding the same route as them, just in front of them. He's also mostly unsupported. I know. So he's sleeping in a tent when he gets a chance or when he gets to the end of the stage, uh, eating baguettes that he gets on the way, tin beans, tin sausages. I think you'd eat anything after riding that far, <laughs> wouldn't you? Exactly. Uh, uh, a, a crazy feat and he's doing it all for charity though. Yeah. I hope he's not riding a bike from 1903. 
That's uh, what I, no, I, I think, think that would so. be a, a be step pushing. too far, wouldn't it? I mean, it's massively impressive. And well, he's doing pretty well on the fundraising front. He's being supported, obviously, by EF Education First and Rafa, his team sponsors, who have donated a thousand bikes to the Buffalo Bike Scheme for a bike for a child in Africa. And that's the equivalent of 120 euros per bike. So on top of that, they're actually opening it up and asking people to donate themselves. If you can donate a whole 120, that is a whole bike, but any amount counts. And so far, uh, this is only two days in again at the time of filming he's raised £25,000 through donations but a total of 147000 or just over and I think that's going up pretty fast if you can keep that up for 23 days that's going to be a whole lot of bucks oh, that he gets by it's going to make I bet it's going to give him that motivation isn't it, when everything's just getting a bit hard work and he's just going to think yeah what, fingers what a difference fingers crossed for him and we're definitely cheering for him from this side yeah amazing well our final piece of try news is sadly well some sad news for the four time Olympic champion Mo Farah We've mentioned it a couple of weeks ago on the show that he was trying desperately to qualify for the 10K. He is the reigning Olympic champion in that distance, went up to marathon and has kind of come back to the track in a bid to try and defend that title. He missed out two weeks ago, I think it's about 40 seconds off the pace, and there was a, an event put on in Manchester for him to really give it one last shot. And I think he came something like 19, yeah, 19 seconds. seconds short. 19 seconds, so close to those Olympic dreams. But yeah, unfortunately, he's, he's not made it. And his coach has said, that was plan B and there's no plan C. Yeah. So uh, I think that might be it for his Olympic dreams for yeah. Tokyo. I mean, uh, massive respect for, you know, not having a plan C that you just could put everything into that basket. And, you know, at least he knows there is no stone unturned and he's now got to work out what's next. On to the racing news this week. At Challenge Kaiserwinkel Volchsee, Nicholas Spirig backed up a very impressive swim bike combination to run away with the title. Uh, she had a solid run of a 1.17.10 half marathon, rode three minutes into Ironman world champion Annie Haug, so uh, she's really looking like and she's And she's in... still on her road bike with clip-on bars, exactly. isn't she? Yeah. yeah, it's all training for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. She certainly looks like yeah. she's on form uh, to challenge for her fifth Olympic Games and maybe be up there for the medals. Mm -hmm. Uh, meanwhile, in the men's event, even a 108 half marathon from Thomas Steger wasn't enough to catch Frederick Funk after his swim bike combination. He had a more than almost seven minute lead going into the run and he managed to hold them off. Belgium's Bart Aeronauts rounding out the podium in that race. Nice. Well, I know you guys last week mentioned that that was the European Championships under the ETU kind of banner, so in a sense, the official ones. But we also had the Ironman 70.3 European Championships, which had an equally impressive field. Just a shame they weren't all racing together. Well, the men's race was won by George Goodwin, so proving that his slot on the podium in Daytona was not a fluke by any means. Now, he had a two-minute deficit after the swim, but managed to bike up to the main pack and then ran away with it what the 108.31 half marathon to take the victory. It was a super um, close race on the men's actually. So I think the top five were within 72 seconds. Second place went to Rudy Von Berg and it was third to Jan Stratman. But on the women's race, while well, it was much more clear cut, we were hoping for a battle between Lucy Charles Barkley and Daniela Reef. But I think after you filmed the show, sadly, there was an announcement from Daniela Reef. No real explanation, but that she wasn't going to be on the start line. So it was a showdown between Lucy and Holly. Now, um, obviously, Holly Lawrence had just come off a win at Des Moines the week before. She did allude to afterwards that maybe her legs weren't quite recovered, but, um, you know, only only she will know that. But Lucy, I mean, you can't take away from that impressive performance. She was the fastest swim, bike and run. I think she got the record for each of them as well, didn't she, within it? So no surprises. She won that race five minutes ahead of Holly Lawrence in second. And it was great to see Camilla Pedersen racing again after having a baby actually on home turf to finish up in third. Over in the USA, and we had Ironman Coeur uh, it looked like it was shaping out to be a big battle between Sam Long and it Lionel did. Sanders again, like we saw in St. George. Uh, didn't quite materialize that way. Lionel had a really good swim coming out with the top guys, uh, just one guy up the road ahead of him, and two minutes in front of Sam Long. But uh, Sam put it to everyone on the bike, yeah. uh, including Lionel, and got off the bike uh, 90 seconds in front of him. Um, but of course, Lionel never wanted to give up, gave chase, and did catch him halfway into the run uh, before that monkey jumped on his back, and it all went sideways for him. He ended up over an hour behind Sam Long at the end, uh, in down in 11th place. Uh, wow. Sam Long, though, didn't falter at all. Ran a, ran a solid 2.51 to take the win by over five minutes over Justin Metzler. 
And uh, third was Pedro Gomez at that race. I mean, Ironman racing is just brutal, isn't it, as you know? And that just really... Lionel did say before the race that his goal was to just enjoy it. That's his main goal. Um, I'm not sure that was his only goal, but I'm not sure he even achieved that goal at that one because no Um, one enjoys the second half of the marathon. As as an age grouper, I could kind of like relate to go and just enjoy it. But as a pro, I I can't see how that could even... When you fall apart like that in the heat like that, uh, you don't enjoy anything about it. So I'm not sure he achieved that goal Yeah, he's not going to be posting that, something like that again, is he? But... I mean, massive hats off that he does just stick it out and doesn't exactly. go like... Kudos for finishing. For yeah, sure. incredible. Well, the women had a, a, saw an impressive performance by Carrie Lester to take the win. She was solid across all three of the disciplines and actually finished, I think, five minutes ahead of a debut performance by Fenella Language, who stamped her Kona card at her very first Ironman yeah, in congrats. very hot conditions, which you know makes it more challenging getting your fueling and, and hydration right. So congratulations to her. Third place was Lindsay Corbin. But the Carrie Lester from that performance has actually moved up from 25th all the way up to 5th in the world rankings on the PTO rankings and more importantly she's now ranked 3rd on the international team rankings and it, that is at the moment in the automatic selection slot but obviously selection hasn't quite closed yet for the Collins Cup. Speaking of the PTO they were supporting the Rev3 Williamsburg in Tennessee. Um, Andrew Starkovitz they're doing what Andrew Starkovitz does. He put six and a half minutes into the whole field on the on the back. Um, he then gave back six of those minutes on the run to, oh. to Jackson Laundry, who tried his best, uh, but fell 30 seconds short and Andrew Starkwood's taking the win ahead of Jackson Laundry there. Uh, on the women's side, Emma Pallant Brown wasn't really challenged, I don't think, for the no, win. It uh, looked quite comfortable. Didn't yeah, it, for it looked her. like it was fairly comfortable ahead of Leslie Smith and Amy Sloan. She did say, though, that it was very hot and humid and shortly after she finished, she had to be taken to the medical tent and was escorted by Andrew Stokowitz. Oh, I saw that <laughs> so, actually, yeah. So he helped her to the, to the medical oh, tent. Wow. Well. Uh, but she was pretty soon back on her feet because she was spraying champagne on the on the podium. So Important I think priorities she, there. <laughs> I think she bounced back pretty yeah. quickly. Yeah, well it's interesting to see because I think she did make a comment that she's now coached by Tim Don and how she's actually able to perform in the heat because that's always been Emma's problem in the past, hasn't it? And she could never, like at Kona, it all fell apart. So it's great to see that maybe she's changing something and you know we will see her being really competitive again in those hot conditions so That's yeah so. have to see well again staying with the pto for one final piece they've just released a couple of new videos one continuing on the um story following chelsea sodaro with her greater than one it's a return to racing after giving birth to her first child this is the third in the series so go and check that one out we've also got a new one which i'm quite excited to see from daniela reef well about daniela reef just looking into sort of her trajectory to being one of the dominant forces that she is in women's racing Looking ahead to this weekend, more racing action. Ironman UK is happening in the Bol- in Bolton. A um, bit of a cut down pro field there because no one can get into the UK. At the <laughs> Don't think anyone wants to get into <laughs> so the UK if they've got any sense. A bit of a free sense. swing for all the UK athletes uh, at that one. Uh, Ironman Lanzarote has a massive field, especially on the men's side. Uh, of interest there, Adam Hansen, who uh, last year was racing as a professional cyclist, uh, He's making his Iron Man pro debut, we think. Oh, he's on the exciting. start list. Um, and he's trying to get that, that Kona slot. So it'd be interesting to see if how he goes. Um, 70.3 Le Sobs in France and a brand new 70.3, 70.3 Andorra oh. at, a, at a new multi-sport festival in that tiny little uh, landlocked country in there. Uh, wow. Well, there's another race that we really can't forget because we at GTN are actually heading over to Holcomb in Norfolk. It's the far east of the UK for the Outlaw Half, which is supported by the PTO. They're putting a prize purse behind it. So there's going to be some exciting racing and we'll be there. So if you guys are around, do make sure you come and say hi. All right, it's time to take a look at your photos and share them. And we've got this first one from Thomas to kick us off. And he sent me a bit of a challenge. Now, I think that Thomas is in Speicherbecken in Germany, but he has challenged me to pronounce that. So I'm open to criticism on it. But anyway, it was a lovely picture here of him donning his GTN cap. Now, this is apparently after or before maybe, they look quite fresh, a DIY triathlon with events being cancelled. They did their own sprint try with a 500 swim, a 20k bike, followed with a 5k run apparently the weather was super good and they had lots of fun and that's what counts also sent in from alessandro following last week's story of the uh, elite athlete racing with one shoe for the whole uh, the whole race because he lost his shoe alessandro in frankfurt in back in 2015 iron man uh, said he did his first iron man in 38 degrees and someone stole his t1 bag uh, so he had to borrow a helmet wore a black polo 
and a pair of oversized running shoes on the bike, so no bike shoes. Um, he did it in a speedo because that's what he was planning to wear for the swim. I'm not entirely sure why his uh, tri suit was in that. Uh, that T1 bag. Well, I guess if he was going to wear the speedo for the swim, and then he does, ah, so he maybe there's puts a lesson for you. He swim must put cycling kit on. In a tri suit. Uh, <laughs> anyway, he did Set the whole the bike in a, in a black golf shirt and sneakers, which uh, must have been uncomfortable. Apparently, yeah. he still finished in 11 hours and seven minutes. So I hope his next race was significantly yeah. faster and God. more comfortable. Yeah, I reckon you'd be. Um, although maybe he was just trying extra hard so he could get off that bike even quicker. Who knows? Um, well, to finish this up, we've got this one from Marco. It's his Diamondback Series F, and he's on top of Emigration Canyon in Salt Lake City, and says his last long ride before a taper for the Ironman Cardellin, which obviously has happened. But I think we all love that feeling when you get that last long ride in the bank and then yeah. It's I hope his race downhill. went well. Let us know how you went. Yeah. And obviously, if you guys have got some photos, you've been out there racing or training, having fun, make sure you share those. The link for the uploader is on screen now, but also in the description below. On to our caption competition. Uh, last week we had this, this picture from the weekend before's Iron Man, uh, run faster or I'll drop the sign. We asked you to improve on his sign. Uh, the first entrant, Ty Martin said, channeled the uh, crazy guy standing in the park naked, saying the end of the run is near. Okay, get that one, nice. Um, Reese, after passing me, don't look back. Good advice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Fergal said, I always worry that after seeing me naked for the first time, women would just scream and run out of the park. And that's clearly what everyone was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like the fact, well, I don't like the fact, all of these captions this week are from men. I mean, no surprises here. Hence why you've chosen the winner and are chuckling. I'm, I'm, yeah, whatever. Anyway, our final runner up comes from Maxime L'Oreal, um, who says, free hug. <laughs> And a Paul Zip, we're gonna we're gonna give him the win, even though none of you guys were particularly creative, and he's gone for maybe oh, the most gave for the jugular here. Yeah. Maybe the most obvious uh, answer. He said, "Don't get me too excited, or I'll need a bigger sign." Congratulations, Paul. Uh, contact us, and we'll send you out a GTN cap. Well now, if last week's caption photo wasn't quite getting your imaginative juices flowing, we've got something a little maybe more tasteful, if this is your thing, from the 70.3 European Championships. And James, I think you've got quite a good one to start yeah, us I'll off, have, haven't I'll you? Have the first go. Um, does what you can't see, can't hurt you, work out for the swim leg? <laughs> I like it, yeah. Um, I've got nothing to come with that one, but I'm sure you guys have got plenty of suggestions. So get them coming, share them in the comments section below. If you're looking for some more to watch on our channel, coming up this week, we have some common racing mistakes. Uh, and I believe Heather went up against a CrossFit athlete. <laughs> I did for my sins. Yeah, I competed against Jamie Simmons. Um, it was a, a great day out. I mean, for her, it was <laughs> uh, honestly, it was great fun. And I haven't seen this video yet, so I'm quite excited to see how it comes together. So make sure you keep an eye out for that one. We've also got some exciting news from the shop. Now, I think already online, we've got three new sweatshirts, which we haven't yet got our hands on, and a new T-shirt. And I think you guys know I'm pretty much always wearing a jumper because I'm normally cold, so I'm quite <laughs> excited to see these as a pale blue a gray and a black so make sure you follow the link on screen and go and check those out and if you've enjoyed this week's show do hit that thumb up like button and if you've not yet done so make sure you hit the globe and subscribe to get all of our videos and there's a couple of videos which i would recommend you watch next one is the unboxing of the brand new shoe from on it's the cloud boom echo and with that there's a giveaway so your chance to win your very own pair of shoes so yeah what are you waiting for and then, of course, we've also got James's initiation.